Section six of Autobiography of Phineas Pett by Phineas Pett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section six. The Autobiography of Phineas Pett, Part two. The persons principally questioned and aimed at, leaving the great master of the office, were Sir Robert Mansell, then treasurer, Sir John Trevor, surveyor, Sir Henry Palmer, controller, Captain Thomas Button, John Leggett, clerk of the check at Chatham, myself, and Sir Thomas Bludder, then victualler to the navy. This year, in the end of July, I began the new gates for Woolwich Dock, and set up a dam without them, so that we wrought always dry, which gates were placed, set up, and finished, and the dam taken away, within the space of nine weeks, wherein I saved to his majesty above four hundred pounds, according to a former estimate, made of the charge of the same under the hands of his majesty's master shipwrights during this business at woolwich it pleased god that my wife was safely delivered of her fourth son in mr lydiard's house in the yard the twenty seventh of april sixteen o eight and was baptized in woolwich church the fifth of may following and named joseph about the beginning of august it pleased the prince's highness my master to send me word that he would come to Woolwich at his return out of Essex from the Lord Peter's, whither his grace was then going in progress. And on Saturday after, being the 13th day of August, his highness took his barge at Blackwall, and came by water to Woolwich about noon, accompanied only with his own train, where I received him on shore at the yard stairs. On the poop of the Anne Royal was placed a noise of trumpets, an ensign and two ensigns upon the head of both the mizzens after my duty presented to his highness with the best expression i could to cause him to understand his welcome to that place and how much it would joy all seamen's hearts to perceive his highness so well addicted to his majesty's ships and the sight of them i conducted his highness round about the dock and so directly aboard the anne royal to the very top of her poop where after my duty performed i gave a secret signal as was before concluded between us to my good friend mr william bull then master gunner of england who stood ready prepared upon a mount in sir hugh lydiard's garden with thirty-one great brass chambers orderly and distinctly placed which with mr gunner's help i had procured from the tower for that purpose he presently receiving the signal diligently attending the same gave fire to the train, and so discharged the whole volley with so good order as gave a marvellous pleasing content to his highness, and the more because he expected no such thing, but that it was done suddenly. When the ordnance gave over, I then kneeled down to his highness and besought him to be pleased to accept this poor sea entertainment from me, as an unfeigned earnest of my duty to him which I would hereafter strive to express in better manner if his highness would be pleased graciously to receive this his first homely welcome. His highness then, having answered my request, with a princely acceptance, commanded me to lead into all the places of the ship, which, having viewed with a great deal of delightful judgment, I led his grace into the yard, and so to the place where the keel, stem, and stern of his own ship, which was to be built, lay ready framed which having perused very seriously and caused the length of the keel to be measured i besought his grace to walk into the house to rest himself which his highness willingly condescending unto i conducted him unto mr lydiard's parlour where was prepared a set banquet of sweetmeats and all other fruits the season of the year could yield with plentiful store of wine both rhenish white sack greek wine and claret his highness was well pleased to take his refection and after the banquet done giving his hand to kiss to divers gentlewomen of the town that were in the room together with my wife his highness desired to be brought to the mount where the chambers were placed which were again laden in this interim and ranged in their first order with the train made ready this sight so much pleased his grace that he was very desirous to have the train fired his highness standing by but at my humble entreaty understanding what danger was incident to such a business he gave me order that at the holding up of his handkerchief in his barge i should see them put off and so taking notice of mr bull 
and giving him his hand to kiss taking his leave i conducted his highness to his barge being the top of full sea where kissing his hand upon my knee he expressed how kindly he accepted his welcome using many gracious speeches to me and so putting off i returned to the mount and upon his highness's signal given me the train was fired and the chambers delivered their loud voices in as distinct order as at the first to the great delight of his highness and general applause of all others there present having now finished by god's providence and gracious assistance the ark which i began to repair in woolwich dock in may was twelve months before on the twenty ninth day of september sixteen o eight i launched her it was a very blustering day the wind at south-west but thanks be to god with a little difficulty she was launched and brought safely to her moorings her name was altered and given by the mouth of my very good friend sir oliver cromwell in presence of sir robert mansell sir john trevor and captain button divers other gentlemen being on board with his majesty's trumpets and drums her name was given the anne royal these knights with the lady mansell the lady trevor mrs button and sundry others dined this day with me at woolwich in mr lydiard's parlour my lodgings being as yet not altered and therefore inconvenient for entertaining of any friends of account which lodgings i after by warrant repaired and made as they now are for which i was greatly questioned by the lord of northampton in his inquisition and stand upon his book of reformation at large recorded the twentieth of october following being thursday by god's good help i lay the keel of the new great ship upon the blocks in the dock and the twenty-eighth day following of the same month i raised her stern and presently after the stem and proceeded in order with the floor as fast as i could notwithstanding the many practices underhand attempted to have diverted the whole course of that building as hereafter in his proper place shall be discovered during the time that i proceeded on with the new frame the inquisition against the navy then growing to the height and prosecuted with extremity of malice against sir john trevor sir robert mansell and some others amongst whom myself held not the least place about the fine of march sixteen o nine there was discovered unto me by mr sebastian vickers carver to the ships my ever true and faithful friend a secret combination against me concerning the building of the great ship suggested first by the practice of my fellows old mr matthew baker and mr william bright old adversaries to my name and family assisted by edward stevens a master shipwright who laid great claim to my place by a former patent to him granted under the broad seal of england with some other shipwrights also joined with them by especial warrant from the great lord of northampton my most implacable enemy my fellows bearing me no small grudge because by the prince's highness means my master i was preferred to that great business before them and mr stevens malicing me because he could not prevail against me to recover my place from me they had also won to their party by much importunity and by means of a particular letter directed from the lord northampton to him to that very purpose a great braggadocio a vain and idle fellow some time a mariner and master called by the name of captain george weymouth who having much acquaintance abroad amongst gentlemen was to disperse the insufficiency of my business reporting how i was no artist and altogether insufficient to perform such a service of no experience and that the king's majesty was co and all the charge lost and the frame of her was unfit for any use but a dung-boat with many other such false opprobrious defamations wherein he was better practised than in any other profession these rumours being thus divulged the report thereof coming to mr sebastian vickers's ears was the cause that he out of his great love and honesty to me wrote to me what he had heard abroad wishing me to keep a careful watch over myself for that they would bend all their practices powers and friends to the disgracing of the building and ruining of me but i being very confident of the goodness of my cause though i received that admonition as from a dear friend 
with much acknowledgment of his love and care of me yet little regarding what their malicious practices could bring forth made small reckoning of their plottings till such time as the good honest man understanding from some of their own mouths what was intended against me made a purposed journey to me to woolwich though he was then scarce able to travel by reason of a tedious sickness and there thoroughly possessed me of the certainty of what he before by his writing had truly informed me i now perceiving it was no idle flimflam as i before supposed considered that the goodness of my cause might by my secure neglect either suffer hazard or be overborne by greatness began to call my wits about me and to advise what was to be done in the business at which time to make good the supposition i reached a message by word of mouth from a worthy gentleman and a good friend of mine mr william burrell principal master workman to the east india company of all their project which was discovered to him particularly by that captain weymouth being at that instant time between drunk and sober the thirteenth of april this weymouth was by consent of the rest sent to woolwich to survey my work and thereupon to deliver his opinion and i in the meantime was appointed to be at redriff at a meeting at a court held for the incorporation of shipwrights whereof i was then master that in my absence he might have the better opportunity to perform his malicious instructions as he was directed by his great masters of the which his purpose i receiving certain intelligence leaving my intended journey to redriff i awaited his coming and receiving him after a courteous manner after some discourse and ordinary compliments he returned back to his confederates frustrate of his great purpose within some few days after i wrote something to this purpose to my very good friends sir robert mansell and sir john trevor being then treasurer and surveyor of the navy desiring them for that it was a business highly concerning the honour of our honourable lord the lord high admiral and their own particular reputations they would be pleased to take the pains to make a sudden journey to woolwich there truly to inform themselves not only concerning the state of the work but of divers other material business wherewith i was to acquaint them at their coming thither according to my request they both came the next day where being thoroughly possessed of all the passages and occurrences concerning the project of our adversaries after they had carefully also surveyed the work with all other things necessary to be advised of leaving me with good deliberation instructions how to proceed in my defence they departed again to westminster the same afternoon presently after the departure of these gentlemen desiring first the lord to guide and direct my pen so as might best tend to his glory and the discharge of my duty i betook myself to my study and in the briefest manner i could i certified the lord admiral of the truth of all the whole project plotted against me with the names of the principalist actors therein and the reasons in inducing them unto it with all earnestly beseeching his lordship to be pleased since the matter so nearly concerned his majesty's profit the honour of the state his lordship's own safety and the reputation of his office to leave all respect of my particular good and to procure such a view to be presently made of the work by judicious and impartial persons as his majesty might receive no loss the search of the kingdom no prejudice the strength of the kingdom no prejudice his honour no impeachment and the officers of the navy no just calumniation nor blame it pleased his lordship then lying at whitehall presently after the receipt of my letter wherewith he was not a little troubled to observe their malicious practices to send for me to wait upon him that by conference with me his lordship might be better informed of each particular passage in this so dangerous information and conspiracy and after his lordship had received from me such satisfaction as he desired comforting me with many noble encouragements as being as he said sufficiently persuaded both of my skill experience and honesty wishing me to take a good heart and never a wit to distrust the goodness of my cause albeit i had strong adversaries for that god in his mercy would never permit such a malicious practice to prevail against those that relied upon him 
with many other fatherly instructions and so being somewhat late for that night his lordship was pleased to dismiss me giving me commandment to attend his further pleasure the next morning and this was the twentieth day of april it was no sooner the next morrow but his lordship very careful of doing something in this weighty business made himself ready and by four o'clock taking my letter in his hand speeds himself to his majesty's chamber lying then also at whitehall and sending in words that his lordship was there to acquaint his majesty with some business of great consequence was presently admitted to his majesty's bedside and having in a few words given his majesty a taste of his errand delivered him my letter and besought him to be pleased thoroughly to peruse the same the letter his majesty twice read over and perceiving how malice was the origin of all this stir seemed greatly to pity the wrong and injury done unto me using this gracious speech in my behalf that whatsoever my act was he knew not but i deserved great commendation for my honest plainness delivered in my letter and that it was great reason i should be justly proceeded withal to the end therefore i might not be wrongfully oppressed and the works disgraced without just cause his majesty took present order with the lord high admiral that he should join unto him the right honourable lords the earls of worcester then master of his majesty's horse and of suffolk then lord high chamberlain and repairing to woolwich should there upon their oaths honours and faithful allegiance to his majesty without respect of any particular person call before them my accusers and as well by examination of them as trial of the work itself both in point of sufficiency as well of matter as manner should truly inform themselves whether this main accusation so much concerning his majesty's honour were justly commenced or no which charge of his majesty being performed they should return the true report thereof with all speed to his majesty as they would answer it upon their allegiance whilst these things were thus ordering my malicious adversaries were not idle but plotting as fast against me and had so far prevailed with the lord northampton that there should be a private warrant directed to the chief of them vide to mr baker bright and stevens and to some other whom they should associate with them which warrant should have been signed with the king's own hand to authorize them to repair to woolwich and there strictly to make a survey of the work which being done upon the return of the insufficiency of the same under their hands and confirmation by oath it was resolved amongst them i should be turned out and for ever disgraced the work utterly defaced and i never to come to any personal answer and one of them that could make his party strongest should undertake the business about which they were in great contention amongst themselves who should be preferred to it but it pleased my good god that never leaves his servants destitute of his help when all other means fail them so mightily to work for me by means of my letter sent to my honourable lord admiral and as is showed afore delivered to his majesty so far to prevent their purpose their purposes that upon that very day wherein they had determined to have displaced and disgraced me that they were unawares to them warned by one of his majesty's messengers to appear before the three lords before named to answer them at that very place and time wherein they made their account to have triumphed over me this was the lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes and this day was appointed to be on tuesday the twenty-fifth day of april which time was accordingly kept and the lords were come to woolwich by nine of the clock the same morning the first thing they did was to take a diligent survey of the work first touching the form and manner of the same and then concerning the goodness of the materials which having very carefully perused they repaired into the house and sat at a little table in the middle of my dining-room their lordships being set first mr baker was called and demanded for the good of his majesty's service to deliver plainly what he could justly accept against the ship either in point of art or in sufficiency of the materials and leading him from point to point concerning her proportion of length breadth depth draught of water height of tuck rake before and abaft breadth of the floor scantling of timber and other circumstances 
after a deal of frivolous arguings to no purpose their lordships found by his examination nothing worthy of observing and directly finding him to be led more out of an envious malicious humour against me than upon any certain ground of error in the mould or probability of insufficiency of any of the materials used in the frame whereupon he was dismissed after him was bright called and then stevens who were so tripped in their several examinations as their lordships found them in their answers clean contrary one to another almost in every question by which their lordships concluded as did as they did of mr baker that all this question and infamous report of the business was plotted by them out of some malicious respects to disgrace me and my works and not of any care or conscionable regard of the good of his majesty's service and so they were dismissed then was the great kilcow weymouth called who being examined as the others before him were was able to say nothing to any purpose but held their lordships with a long tedious discourse of proportions measures lines and an infinite rabble of idle and unprofitable speeches clean from the matter wherewith their lordships were so tired as he was commanded silence then every man being dismissed the room they consulted in private about some half hour and then we were all called in again where their lordships addressing their speech to me delivered that by all this inquiry they in their judgments could find no just cause of exception against the business and this accusation grew for aught they could perceive out of envy and malice and therefore i had no cause to be discharged in my service but to go on both comfortably and cheerfully assuring me they would so effectually return the account of the particulars of this their day's work to his majesty as should not only give his majesty satisfaction but also secure and defend me from all the opposition any of my adversaries could practise against me with many other noble speeches of encouragement and so about four of the clock in the evening taking their carroches they returned to the court of whitehall the same night after their coming to the court their lordships repairing to his majesty they were delivered the account of their journey together with all the particular passages in the same there offering to prove upon their honours allegiances and their lives the ground of that conspiracy to spring from no other reason than inveterate malice to me and that they found the business in every part and point so excellent as befitted the service of so royal a king with which his majesty rested marvellous well satisfied my adversaries whose malicious practices nothing could daunt hunting after nothing so much as my ruin and utter disgrace were so fired with this prevention that redoubling their fury they went all together the next morning to their great patron and abettor the lord northampton who being vehemently incensed before to have such an affront to the proceeding of his commission as he termed our courses to have wrought was willing to entertain anything that carried but likelihood to give him means to be revenged on me for it after therefore these caterpillars had discovered to his lordship all the circumstances of the hearing before the lords complaining very grievously as they termed it of their partiality towards me and bitterness to them and that they were not suffered to speak nor could be heard in anything they could inform against me they offering upon their lives to make good all their information against me to be true so that they might but gain an equal hearing his lordship promised to move his majesty in the granting of a second hearing wherein he doubted not as he said unto them but they should have amends made to them for the former injuries and obtain their purpose against me in despite of all my friends and upholders his lordship immediately upon this repaired to his majesty and there made a grievous complaint against the partiality of the three lords which they showed in the examination of the business there in the behalf of the plaintiffs tendering to his majesty that they did offer upon their lives to prove all their informations true and besought his majesty very earnestly there might be a second examination committed to his lordship's care whereby all partiality should be prevented and his majesty receive better confirmations of their good service than what the lords had before upon their superficial survey and partial examination exhibited to his majesty 
His Majesty made answer that upon his lordship's first complaint he had made especial choice of three principal peers of the realm, of whose faithful fidelity he was so confidently assured that he could not but give credit to that account. Their lordships had returned upon the serious examination of that so weighty a business. Notwithstanding, seeing his lordship urge so earnestly a review and second examination, since it was a business of such main consequence, for his better satisfaction and clearing all doubts and scruple, his majesty resolved to take the pains in his old person to have the hearing of the cause indifferently between all parties, appointing Monday, the 8th of May following, to be the time for the same hearing at Woolwich in the yard where the ship was then in building, giving order to the Lord High Admiral of England to provide for the same, and to command all such persons as were any ways interested in that business, to give their personal attendance upon his majesty at the same time and place this resolution of his majesty made known there was preparation on both sides to be provided both of information and defence to give his majesty satisfaction but the contrary parties doubting their malicious practices would now be plainly discovered never dreaming of such a course they still laboured to bring disgraces upon me informing in the interim of ten days if I might be suffered to continue the workmen upon the frames, I would so handle the matter that all things should be reformed that have by them been formerly found defective, both in point of materials and proportions, and therefore were earnest suitors to have all the workmen presently discharged and the work to stand. His Majesty, upon the advice of some of the lords, whereof the then Lord Treasurer Sir Robert Cecil and Earl of Salisbury being chief, would not consent on any condition to have the workmen absolutely discharged, but that order should be taken the work should cease, and the men continued at his majesty's charge till the hearing should pass, and his majesty determine what was after to be done. Whereupon his majesty commanded a letter to be written to me to the same effect, charging me upon my allegiance to follow the directions therein contained, which I accordingly very carefully observed. In the meantime, no day almost passed, wherein Mr. Baker, Bright, Stevens, Clay, Graves, Captain Weymouth, and their malicious associates did not meet at Woolwich to take all the dimensions of the ship, to deface the work by striking aside the shores, and condemning the materials, aggravating continual disgraces upon me, and railing despitefully to my face, which I was forced to endure with patience, and put up with silence flying to god on whose mercy i wholly depended in these extremities the good lord admiral was not idle in this interim to provide for to give his majesty full satisfaction in all things that could be objected by the informers and to that purpose carefully advising with sir robert mansell and sir john trevor principal officers of his majesty's navy together with myself whom it did most concern what course was to be held to meet all objections could be any ways produced against me and for that the adverse part had made choice of a certain number of masters and builders in the river of thames to strengthen their proceedings if was held fit and resolved the like course should be taken by us for our better defence whereupon sundry experienced men known to be honest and impartial of both kinds were nominated and appointed by warrant from the lord admiral to attend this service some inhabiting about the river of thames and others of remote places with whom diverse consultations were held as well to inform them of the truth of every particular as also to satisfy their doubts in anything wherein it was fit they should be thoroughly resolved i for my own part confident of mine own integrity commending my cause to god provided myself to be able to answer all objections whatsoever could be alleged against me, either in point of art, experience, or care, in this so weighty service of trust and consequence. I must not here forget the princely favour of my royal then master, Prince Henry, of ever-famous memory, who, in his noble care of me in the interim of the time appointed by his majesty for my hearing, did almost every day send me a comfortable encouragement by some one of his principal gentlemen to heart me on and put life into me lest i should any ways be disheartened with the apprehension of the power of my great and potent adversary 
and when the time grew near for my trial sent me a commandment to wait upon his grace the sunday preceding the day at st james's which i accordingly performed where his highness vouchsafing to lead me in his hand through the park to whitehall in the public view and hearing of many people there attending to see him pass to the king his father did in such loving manner counsel me with such comfortable wise and grave advice touching my carriage and resolution in my trial as was no little testimony of his principal care of me to my great comfort and joy of all those that were both eye and ear witnesses of it besides casting the worst that might be if i had been overthrown by the censure of his majesty his highness had graciously determined to have received me into a place in his house and resolved to have provided for me whilst i had lived the time drawing now near there was sent from london at the appointment of the lord admiral hangings to furnish the room where his majesty was to sit and the next room to it where he was to withdraw the one being the common dining room of the workmen and the other my own dining room both which i caused to be hanged and trimmed up with such furniture as was befitting such a presence with all convenience the place could anyways afford on monday morning being the eighth day of may the lord admiral came betimes to woolwich attended by sir robert mansell sir john trevor and others where his lordship was met by all those persons which were formerly warned to be there on our part and his lordship took those rooms which were fitted for his majesty presently after came the lord northampton attended with all the spiteful crew of his informers and he took hugh lydiard's house being clerk of the check which was fitted for him and was there attended with all his rabble before his majesty's coming weymouth and his associates pried up and down the yard belching out nothing but disgraces despiteful speeches and base opprobrious terms being so confident of their wished ends as they before had given out that i should be hanged and the work defaced at the least which was likely enough to have proved so had not god put a hook into their nostrils and by the justice of the king caused themselves to fall into the pit they had digged for another the noble admiral spent the time till his majesty's coming very quietly and privately consulting advisedly with those appointed for the business never so much as taking notice of the base usage of them on their side all things being in a readiness about eight of the clock his majesty came in his caroche attended with prince henry and the principal lords of his majesty's council the lord northampton met him before he came to the ordinary gate of the yard and used all the means he could to have led his majesty through lydiard's garden by a back way into his house but his majesty told his lordship that the lord admiral whom he espied waiting with his train at the ordinary gate of the yard would justly take exception at his doing so for that it belonged properly there to his lordship to receive and entertain him so alighting the lord admiral after his duty performed guided his majesty to the rooms provided purposely for the business whom i ushered as belonged to my place after his majesty had a little repose he desired the lord admiral to bring him to the site of the work then in hand which accordingly was done directing his majesty to a brow or stage made at the stem of the ship where he might perfectly take a perfect view of the whole groundwork of the frame being then about half set up and planked as high as the rung heads no foot wailing as then begun after his majesty had satisfied himself sufficiently he returned back to the place again and there seated himself in the chair under the state at a little table standing right before him the prince and the lords taking their stands on his majesty's right hand and the lord admiral and all those warned on our part and the lord northampton on the left hand of his majesty with all his crew of informers and others appointed to assist him on his part of sea-masters and shipwrights of the thames these things thus ordered his majesty silence being commanded by his gentlemen ushers his majesty began a very worthy speech first to signify the cause of his coming to that place and how much it imported the royal care of a king to take to his personal examination a business of such consequence 
as so much concerned the strength and honour of his kingdom and state, besides the expense of his treasure. Next, he addressed his speech to the actors on both sides, to those that were informers and to those that were defendants. The substance of his royal speech tending to a religious exhortation that none of both sides should either accuse for malice or other pretence, or excuse for love, favour, or other particular respects, for that his majesty, in the seat of justice presenting God's person, would not be deluded, nor led by any coloured pretences from understanding the very plain truth of that business which was to be handled, and therefore willed such on both sides whose conscience accused them, either of malicious proceedings, private ends, or partial favour, to give over and depart before they took the oath to be administered unto them, threatening severe punishments to those should be found offenders herein, declaring what danger it was to be perjured before the majesty of God and the king. His majesty's speech so effectually delivered to the purpose of the matter in hand, to the admiration of the hearers, commandment was given to call the names of those to be sworn on both sides. On Lord Northampton's side were Sir Henry Middleton, Mr. Hugh Merritt, Captain Watts, Captain Norries, Mr. Chester, Captain Weymouth, Captain Newport, Seaman, Robert Rickman, Thomas Redwood, Captain Gear, Captain Moore, Mr. James Woodcock, Mr. Matthew Woodcock, Captain Miller, Shipwrights, Mr. Matthew Baker, Mr. William Bright, Mr. Edward Stevens, Captain Weymouth, Mr. Clay, Mr. Graves, Mr. Trankmore, Mr. Lydiard, other informers thomas buck clifton a baker sworn on our part mr william jones mr william bygat mr michael merriel mr john king mr george ireland mr arthur pett mr john woodcott seaman mr thomas fuller mr robert wright mr thomas johnson mr john dawes mr nicholas diggins Mr. Jordan, Mr. Michael Edmonds, Shipwrights, Mr. William Burrell, Mr. Nicholas Simonson, Mr. Thomas Jenkins, Mr. Thomas Cole, Mr. Thomas Prime, Carpenters of His Majesty's Navy, Lawrence Andrews, David Duck, Robert Bromwich, Thomas Catterall, John Ely, Thomas Hampton, Nicholas Surtis, Robert Sharp. These several persons being called and appearing, the form of the oath was read unto them by the right honourable Sir Robert Cecil, Earl of Salisbury, and then Lord Treasurer, who personated the clerk of the session, and the book was presented to them by the right honourable Charles Howard, Earl of Nottingham, Lord High Admiral of England. These ceremonies performed, His Majesty willed the Lord Northampton to begin his accusation, and then I was called personally to answer and kneeled right before his majesty near the side of the table the lord high admiral standing at my left hand sir robert mansell and sir john trevor standing both right behind me the accusation against me was exhibited by the lord northampton in writing containing sundry articles in point of my sufficiency art and experience and in point of my care and honesty in discharge of my duty in putting in unserviceable materials to the great detriment of his majesty's service his majesty perceiving the articles to be many and very intricate to answer each particular very judiciously contracted all the business to three principal heads the point of art the point of sufficiency of materials and the point of charge and to these heads i was commanded to frame my answers and they their accusations I must confess that at the first I was so daunted with the majesty of the king, the power of my adversary, and the confused urging of the objections, that I was confounded in myself till it pleased God by the help of the Lord Treasurer and his discreet directions. I was recollected and recovered my spirits, and so orderly answered to each objection, his majesty still holding us on both sides to the proposition much time was spent in dispute of proportions comparing my present frame with former precedents and dimensions of the best ships for length breadth depth floor and circumstances 
in all which they could not fasten anything upon me but reflected to their disgrace and apparent breach of oath and plain demonstration and expression of combined practice one point of proportion was mainly insisted upon and with much violence and eagerness urged on both sides which was the square of the ship's flat in the midships they affirming constantly upon their oath it was full thirteen foot we as constantly insisting that it was but eleven foot and eight inches but because this difference was long and could not be tried upon small plates his majesty referred the trial to be made upon the great platform which was purposely framed of planks to the full scale of the ship where all the lines of the midship bend were drawn and the square of the flat truly described with their centres perpendiculars and sweeps which trial because it much concerned the truth or falsity of all the rest his majesty would not give trust to any of those that were by oath interested in the same but made choice of the noble and worthy knight sir thomas chaloner then governor of the prince's highness's household and of the learned reverend gentleman mr briggs reader of geometry lecture in gresham college in london and master of art and student in st john's in cambridge who were to decide this controversy this thus concluded we came to the point of charge to which was answered that the charge of the building of this ship should not exceed other ships that have been built in her majesty's times i mean queen elizabeth of famous and happy memory allowing proportion for proportion the garnishing not exceeding theirs this gave full satisfaction to the point of charge being the second head propounded it then being almost one of the clock his majesty called for his dinner referring the other points to be handled in the ship after dinner all this time i sat upon my knees baited by the great lord and his band dogs sometimes by baker sometimes by bright stevens clay gaping weymouth and sometimes confusedly by all and which was worse his majesty's angry countenance still bent upon me so that i was almost disheartened and out of breath albeit the prince's highness standing near me from time to time encouraged me as far as he might without offence to his father labouring to have me eased by standing up but his majesty would not permit it so soon as his majesty and the lords had dined the king rose and went into the body of the frame of the ship to make trial of the goodness of the materials all the lower futtocks were placed and many upper futtocks also the adverse part had chalked with a mark almost half the lower futtocks for red wood cross-grained and merely unserviceable all which timbers his majesty caused to be dubbed by the workmen ready with their tools for that purpose and being tried they were all approved very sound and serviceable and touching the cross-grained timber his majesty protested very earnestly the cross-grain was in the men and not in the timber his majesty spent much time in the survey of these things still giving way to what objections the adverse part could allege and what answer i could make in my defence this business performed within board and his majesty well satisfied in every particular he openly delivered that the ship would be too strong if one third of the timber were left out and then began to give me a princely countenance and encouragement protesting oftentimes that all this grievous accusation proceeded of nothing but malice then his majesty came without board and curiously surveyed the planks and tree nails and workmanship all which gave him such good satisfaction as still confirmed his opinion of their malicious proceedings all the while his majesty was intentive upon this search the gentlemen forenamed that were appointed for the trial of the point of the true flat of the floor they were busied in taking off the measures from the ship and bringing them to the platform and when they found by due trial all the lines to be truly set off they acquainted his majesty that all things was in readiness his majesty then having received satisfaction of all things about the frame repaired to the platform attended with the prince the lords and many thousand spectators besides his majesty then caused those gentlemen to measure each dimension of breadth and depth for his own satisfaction and then coming to the point of the square of the floor whether it were answering their assertion of thirteen foot or agreeable to ours of eleven foot eight inches 
the square of thirteen foot was tried from the true centre and perpendicular which being applied to the sweeps of the mould did differ above sixteen inches at the rung head the like trial being made by our true centre and perpendicular fell as just in our lines as could be possibly which done his majesty with a loud voice commanded the measurers to declare publicly the very truth which when they had delivered clearly on our sides all the whole multitude heaved up their hats and gave a great and a loud shout and acclamation and then the prince's highness called with a high voice in these words where be now these perjured fellows that dare thus abuse his majesty with these false informations do they not worthily deserve hanging by that time all these things were thus performed and his majesty wonderfully satisfied and it growing somewhat late his majesty returned again into the hall where he formerly sat and being placed and the room filled as full as it could be packed his majesty began a most worthy and learned speech for conclusion of the business the scope of his words tending first to a full declaration of the satisfaction he had received touching this great business wherein he expressed with many effectual speeches what content he received in bestowing his pains that day to so good a purpose next his majesty addressed himself to give thanks to the lord northampton for his great care and diligence to search out such errors in the office of the admiralty wherein his majesty and the state were abused with encouragement for him to go forward with prosecuting his commission notwithstanding his lordship had been misinformed by being drawn to question the present business next his majesty directed his speech to mr baker bright stevens and the rest of the informers very bitterly reprehending their malicious practices more to bring to effect their own private ends than out of any conscionable care of the good of his majesty's service or benefit of the state repining at the preferment i had and the countenance of the prince his son and therefore combining together to disgrace and ruin me though otherwise they envied one another and were at controversy who should be preferred to my business with many good exhortations to will them to beware how they did abuse the majesty of god and himself his substitute with malicious informations in which he could do no less than think them perjured as in the prosecuting of this whole business was too apparent to himself and all the world whereby they deserved to be severely punished if he should censure them as they worthily merited his majesty then began to show me a very pleasing countenance and turned his speech to me willing me not to be discountenanced with these proceedings against me since he was now sufficiently persuaded of my honesty integrity and abilities to perform what i had undertaken advising me not to refuse counsel of my fellow-servants since it was his service wherein we ought to join together for his good and the honour of the state with many other princely expressions of his good opinion of me and readiness not only to give me countenance but assurance of future favour towards me and lastly he cleared all imputations and aspersions unjustly cast upon the lord high admiral with recital of all his honourable services performed to the honour of the state and his perpetual fame commending his great wisdom and impartial carriage of himself in this day's trial wherein he was never observed to give any impediment to his majesty's judicial proceedings but all furtherance possible as was both evidently manifest to his majesty by the great pains he had endured that day and the noble patience he had given public testimony of to all present which were eye-witnesses of it with many other gracious speeches to put new life and power into him to go on as he had begun to the perpetual eternizing his name and honour then giving general thanks to those that had taken pains in that day's business with protestation of his princely care in all matters of such consequence for the safety and honour of the state and kingdom he concluded his speech then the noble admiral as his majesty was rising humbly besought his majesty to license him to speak a few words as well to declare his own innocency concerning these unjust accusations as to clear me in the point both of my sufficiency and my care and honesty 
to perform the service entrusted to me to which his honourable request though it grew now to be late his majesty most willingly condescended the sum of his lordship's speech tended to admire and extol his majesty's justice great wisdom and princely care of the good of the commonwealth in which he had refused no pains as this day's work and honourable assembly could justly witness to provide to rectify and set straight to the wonder and admiration of them all a work of so great a consequence and of such a kind of intricacy as his majesty had never been accustomed to before and yet so clearly to examine and try in so short a space as if he had only been bred and accustomed to such elements with many other honourable speeches tending to that purpose his lordship then laying his hand upon my head standing next unto him upon his right hand did there freely offer to pawn all his lands his honour and his life in my behalf for the performance and finishing of this royal work which being once perfected if his majesty by the advice of the best experienced artist and seaman of the kingdom should dislike he would willingly with help of his take off from his majesty's hands at his and their proper charge without any damage or loss to his majesty and this did his lordship deliver with such bold assured confident earnestness as gave much content to his majesty and satisfaction to the prince the lords and most part of the rest of the standers by to this speech his majesty replied briefly with gracious acknowledgments of his princely acceptance of his lordship's true faithful service and zeal expressed in that his worthy speech of which he had so great assurance as he confidently protested never king could be more happy than himself in the service of such an honourable subject and therefore there was no need why he should any ways engage neither himself nor his honour in that which his majesty had by the course of upright justice before the face of god and the world so apparently cleared this said his majesty rose in passing through the hall the lord admiral going before and leading me in his hand the lord thomas howard then lord chamberlain of the household made a motion to his majesty to lay a charge upon me that i should not make any quarrel against any person or persons that had that day given information against me alleging he knew my stomach to be such as if i were not contained by his majesty's commandment i would call them to account for their doings whereupon blood might ensue his majesty giving ear to what his lordship advised gave him thanks for his worthy counsel and calling me unto him before the whole company i sitting upon my knees he gave me an especial charge upon my allegiance and life that i should not quarrel or challenge any person or persons whatsoever that had that day given information against me alleging i had honour sufficient to have been cleared of all questions and objections unjustly laid to my charge by the equity of my cause and his justice this speech concluded his majesty hastened to take his carush which attended at the gate the noble lord admiral brought me in his hand to his majesty to kiss his royal hand and take my leave his majesty gave me his hand to kiss with such an expression of his princely favour and encouragements to proceed cheerfully in my business as did not only infuse new life into me but also gave great comfort and content to all the standers by then i presented myself upon my knee to the most noble prince my then master who taking me from the ground did so affectionately express his joy for my clearing and the satisfaction his father had received that day that he protested he would not only countenance and comfort me hereafter but care to provide for me and my posterity while he lived i received the like noble courtesy from all the lords who declared their joy for the happy success god gave me in this great deliverance the great lord of northampton seeing the event of this business and that all things sorted out clean contrary to his expectation railing bitterly against his informing instruments took the back way to his coach and would not so much as take any leave of his majesty but posted away with no little expression of great discontentment as did also the rest of his partakers the lord admiral attended his majesty being never better contented in all his life 
and returned to Whitehall with the company, it being almost eight of the clock before they went from Woolwich. Sir Robert Mansell, Sir John Trevor, Captain Button, and the rest of my good friends followed, amongst whom was the good old Lady Mansell and Mrs. Button, who had taken the pains to attend the hearing in an inner room all that day. This day, as it was a very tedious day unto me by reason I was to answer all objections and kneel so long together, so was it a day of jubilee to me, a day never to be forgotten of me nor mine, wherein my good God showed me wonderful favour and mercy, to enable me to endure the frowns of the king, and to strengthen my weak abilities to withstand the malice of such and so many powerful adversaries by the space of one whole long summer's day, for his majesty, albeit he was sufficiently persuaded of their malice and my integrity, yet till he had cleared all doubts by the course of strict examination, and found me in his justice guiltless, he would show me no countenance at all, but after their malice was discovered, and all those heads and points fully answered and clearly resolved, his majesty then both in countenance, words, and all other princely expressions, declared his royal disposition towards me. End of section 6section seven of autobiography of phineas pett by phineas pett this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven the autobiography of phineas pett part three the next day being the ninth of may i began the work again every man striving to express his willingness thereunto by reason of the great encouragement his majesty had publicly and generally given to them and within two or three days after, the Lord Admiral, Sir Robert Mansell, and Sir John Trevor, advising together with me, we resolved to move the Lords of the Council to have two principal men, which were Master Shipwrights, to be by their order appointed to repair twice at least in the week to Woolwich, to survey the provisions, and to foresee that no unserviceable materials should be wrought upon the ship, which we did to clear all suspicions of any ends of our own. This accordingly was consented to of the Lords, and Mr. Matthew Baker and Henry Reynolds were appointed to be the overseers, who, for fashion's sake, some three or four times came to Woolwich, but finding our care to be more to perform honestly than theirs could be to prevent with their best endeavours, they gave over the trust recommended to them and left me to myself. The 7th of June following, the Red Lion, which was newly rebuilt by Mr. Baker at Deptford, was launched, where was present the King's Majesty and the Prince. I attending then near the place at the great storehouse end, where His Majesty had his standing. He was pleased very graciously to confer with me, and to use me with extraordinary expressions of his princely favour. The 8th day of June, being the Thursday in Whitsun Week, his Majesty began to hear the great and general cause of the Navy in his presence chamber at Greenwich, wherein three whole days were spent in several examinations of the truth and circumstances of the informations delivered by the Lord Northampton and his agents against Sir Robert Mansell, Sir John Trevor, Captain Button, Sir Thomas Bludder, Mr. Leggett, myself, and many others. The first day the Lord Northampton made the very entrance into the business a great complaint of the dishonour he reaped by my hearing at Woolwich, insisting very maliciously in incensing his majesty against me and others, who, as he said, traduced him in every tavern and ale-bench to his great dishonour, and therefore humbly besought his majesty that business might be again called in question, alleging the confidence of the informers who were ready to maintain the truth of their former informations with their lives. His Majesty, taking it ill that my Lord should dare to question his just proceedings, which he had taken such pains personally to hear and determine, took him short off with a sharp reprehension, and willed him no further to insist upon that whereof his Majesty and the whole world were so sufficiently satisfied. But if he had aught else to say, he should proceed with that, and he was there ready to hear and to do him all right. 
then his lordship began to deliver sundry particular bitter accusations against sir robert mansell sir john trevor and the rest all savouring more of malice than of truth as was apparent by every man's answer when they were called to speak for themselves on saturday being the tenth of june and the last day of hearing to conclude all i was called the last man to answer a grievous accusation for my spanish voyage made in the resistance when i attended the lord admiral for the conclusion of the peace captain norries being then the principal informer it was laid to my charge i had transported and sold to the spaniards divers tons of brass ordnance and other provisions of powder and shot but after it came to the trial all proved nothing but ridiculous moose his majesty being made privy to all the proceeding in that business by the lord admiral when he was in spain so that i was fully cleared of all those scandalous and false informations by his majesty's own mouth to the shame and disgrace of those that were principal actors and prosecutors of it and thus was that great hearing fully concluded at greenwich it must not be forgotten how the lord in his justice did revenge my injuries and wrongs even upon all those that were sworn against me but because in modesty i will spare to nominate some and in what particulars they were afterwards in special matters beholding to me yet i must not pass over one remarkable accident that happened to one of them in this manner captain george weymouth before mentioned being one of the most violent and bitterest adversaries that came against me happened to have drawn in a knight of hampshire to be so credulously confident of his special art in building of ships that he trusted him to have the oversight and direction of building a small ship for him which was expected to have been so rare a sailor and every way so well conditioned as she should run beyond the moon but in the end when she came to be tried she proved the veriest bauble and drown devil that ever went to sea and so plainly cozened the knight both of his charge and expectation the provisions of cordage anchors sails munition and other furniture were to come from london and captain weymouth was trusted both to ship them and to convey them to the vessel and for the better security he resolved to embark himself with them and falling down as low as the north foreland there mistaking his course as he did in the northwest passage instead of going to shoreham in sussex he went for flushing and so pretending some lame excuse to colour his pretence passed from thence to antwerp where it is most certain he proffered to sell all his commodities and his service also had he not been prevented albeit he enjoyed a pension of ten groats per diem here in england from his majesty under the title of master engineer this his juggling was not so privately conveyed but notice and advertisement was given and sent to the lords of the council and by their lordships to the lord high admiral whereupon strict order was taken that he should be apprehended as a pirate if he at any time were found in england upon knowledge hereof he secretly stole over and got to london and there very privately by means of one mr pory a gentleman having some near dependence upon the right honourable the earl of salisbury then the lord treasurer of england his case was made known to his lordship to be a means to his majesty for his pardon his lordship very well remembering what part he played at my hearing at woolwich and what particular notice his majesty and the prince's highness took of his dishonest and base carriage utterly disclaimed him so much as to hear him named but being very much importuned by mr pory and one old keema he advised his safest course to be to make his way to the lord admiral in whose power he was now fallen by piracy and that he had no better or readier way to effect this but to repair to me and to confess his former injuries and truly to deliver by what means and working he was drawn into that business and so to offer me as public satisfaction as he had done me public injury that i might be a mean both to the prince's highness and to the lord admiral he might upon this submission be both pardoned and received into favour 
this council was presently followed and a great supper bespoken at the three cranes in the vintry by mr poory and mr keema to which i was trained by a solemn invitation by them both by a letter sent to me to woolwich that very morning before the supper intended we met according to appointment and after some compliments passed poory and keema drawing me aside into a private room there discovered unto me the cause of their meeting and sending for me which when i thoroughly understood i refused either to say or see weymouth but at length won by their importunities and the rather for that they confidently assured me this was done by the advice of my most honourable good lord the lord treasurer i was contented to stay supper with them and weymouth came in and sat at the same table without any speech concerning the business supper ended mr poory began to break the matter to this effect that captain weymouth there present acknowledging his error in doing me so great an injury was purposely come in their company to offer me what satisfaction i would desire confessing it now lay in my power either to undo him or to recover his lost reputation and to perform what i should enjoin him in what public manner i would require to this i answered that first i never had any conversation with weymouth nor did ever give him any cause to be my enemy in so great a height as to accuse me before a king in the presence of such an audience wherein no less than my life was questioned aggravating each circumstance of his malicious carriage towards me as well as i could then remember to be short captain weymouth there rising from the table in the presence of all that were there fell on his knee and desired me as i was a gentleman to pardon what he had inadvisedly done against me all the circumstances he would truly discover if i would give him leave to speak and then rising from the ground laid down his sword at my feet there vowing in the presence of god and that company both himself his life and his sword should be ever at my command and service he then freely delivered by whom he was first solicited to join in that business against me which was mr baker bright and the rest for the space of two months together to whom he made flat denial to join in such a malicious practice and did never condescend till they procured him to be sent for by a letter from the lord northampton to come to speak with him by whose flatteries and fair promises he was enticed to be a party with them and this he offered to make good upon his oath whensoever he should be called upon this his submission i was contented to forgive the injury done to me in my own particular but i could not promise to mediate betwixt him and the prince my master nor the lord admiral this was accepted upon my promise i would not aggravate anything against him and thus spending almost the whole night i took my leave and so took boat and returned that morning to woolwich and this was about the eighteenth of november this meeting was not so private but that his highness and the lord admiral had notice of it whereupon the prince sent for me and commanded me to deliver the truth which i accordingly did in each particular his highness disliked that i did not acquaint him with it but when i assured him of the manner of my training thither with some little check he was satisfied and the lord treasurer did so mediate for him to the good lord admiral that his pardon was granted but himself from that time after till his dying day which shortly followed was never received to favour nor good opinion in the beginning of january following there were two new ships builded at deptford for the east india merchants to be launched whereat his majesty with the prince and divers lords were present and feasted with a banquet of sweetmeats on board the great ship in the dock which was called the trade's increase the other was called the peppercorn the names being given by his majesty i did there attend and received gracious public usage from his majesty the prince and the lords but the tide was so bad that the great ship could not be launched out of the dock and the smaller which was built upon the wharf was so ill-stroken upon the launching ways that she could by no means be put off which did somewhat discontent his majesty the last day of january the prince's highness came to woolwich to see in what forwardness the ship was in where i gave him and his followers entertainment the seventh day of january by commandment from the prince's highness 
I attended at the great feast made by him at St. James's to the King, Queen, Duke of York, Lady Elizabeth, the Lords of the Council, and all the knights that were actors at the barriers. The supper was not ended till after ten at night, from whence they went to the play, and that ended, returned again to a set banquet in the gallery where the supper was, the table being above one hundred and twenty foot long, and it was three of the clock in the morning before all was finished. The ninth of February, my wife's brother, John Nichols, being a linen draper dwelling in Friday Street, died of the sickness. The twenty fifth of April, the Prince's Highness came to Woolwich and dined there, with all his train in my dining room. The twenty seventh of April, my sister Lydia, whom I was glad to maintain a long time before, with a poor man that was her husband, died at Plumstead, and was there buried at my charge. The thirtieth of this month, the resistance was launched out of my brother Simonson's dock at Ratcliffe, where she was newly repaired. The second of May, the Lady Elizabeth with her train came to see the great ship at Woolwich, and was entertained by my wife, I being then at London. About the tenth of May, this present year, I bought Sir John Trevor's third part of the resistance, so that I had two third parts of her to myself. The eighteenth of June, the Prince's Highness came to Woolwich to see the ship, who was now in great forwardness and almost ready, and the next day after he came thither again in company of the King his father, and a great train attending them in the afternoon. His Majesty spent almost two hours in great content in surveying the ship, both within and without, protesting it did not repent him to have taken such great pains in examination of the business of that work, since the fruit thereof yielded him such contination. His Majesty then did me the honour to come into the house, where my wife had prepared a banquet of sweetmeats and such fruits as were then to be had, whereof he was pleased to taste plentifully, and did very graciously accept of his homely entertainment, giving me a special commandment not to launch the ship till his progress was ended. Between Easter and Michaelmas, that the ship began to be garnished, it is not credible what numbers of people continually resorted to Woolwich of all sorts, both nobles, gentry, citizens, and from all parts of the country round about, which was no small charge to me in giving daily entertainment to all comers, which could not be possibly avoided in that place at such a time. In the beginning of August I was summoned to Chatham with my fellow master shipwrights, there to take a survey of the navy according to the yearly custom. Sir John Trevor, then surveyor, attended that service personally, where we spent four days in performing that business, and so returned to Woolwich. The sixth of this month of August, my wife was delivered of her fifth son, at Woolwich in my own lodgings, between the hours of six and seven o'clock in the morning, being Thursday and the sixteenth day of the same month he was baptized in the church at Twillage upon a Thursday in the forenoon. The witnesses were my brother Peter and brother William Brooke, godfathers, and my wife's mother, Mistress Catherine Nichols, godmother. The twenty-second of this month I let out the resistance for a voyage into the Straits at the rate of one hundred pounds per mensum, with thirty-six men. Mr. William Gibbons appointed the master. The thirty-first day I rode to Nonsuch, to the prince, that then was there in hunting, who, of his nobleness, promised to send me a buck to Woolwich, because he had then given all away that were fallen that day. The ninth of September, being Sunday, about six of the clock in the evening, diverse London maids, coming to see the ship, brought in their company a little boy of twelve years old, the only child of his mother a widow woman dwelling in tower street who carelessly going up and down upon the main orlop fell down into the hold of the ship and was thereby so broken and bruised that he died before midnight being the first mischance that did happen in the whole time of the ship's building about the middle of this month being ready to have the ship stroken down upon her ways i caused twelve of the choice master carpenters of his master's navy to be sent for from chatham to be assistance in her striking and launching, and upon the eighteenth day, being Tuesday, she was safely set upon her ways, 
and this day sir robert mansell came and dined with me in my lodgings the twentieth of this month the french leaguer ambassador came to woolwich to see the ship whom i entertained in the best manner i could and in the time of his being within the prince my royal master sent me a wonderful fat buck which he killed with his own hand now began we on all sides to make preparation for the launching of the ship and for that purpose there was provided a rich standard of taffety very fairly gilt with gold with his majesty's arms to be placed upon the poop with a very large ensign of crimson rich taffety with a canton of the prince's crest to be placed upon the quarter-deck and all other ornaments very carefully provided for befitting that purpose there was a standing set up in the most convenient place in the yard for his majesty the queen and their royal children and places fitted for the ladies and council all railed in and boarded all the rooms both in my own lodgings and at mr lydiard's were prepared and very handsomely hanged and furnished with a cloth of state chairs stools and other necessaries nothing was omitted that could be imagined any ways necessary both for ease and entertainment upon sunday in the afternoon being the twenty-third day of september sir robert mansell sir john trevor and sir henry palmer came to woolwich to see how everything was ordered and finding all things prepared and fitted to their likings about three of the clock they returned all to deptford where they lodged that night at sir robert mansell's this evening very late there came a messenger to me from them bringing a letter which was sent to them from court at theobald's to give me order to be very careful to search the ship's hold for fear some treacherous persons might have bored some holes privily in the ship to sink her after she should be launched but my care had prevented their fears aforehand so far as possibly could be searched or discerned on monday morning assisted by the help of my brother simonson and sundry other my friends we opened the dock gates and made all things ready against the tide but the wind blowing very hard at south-west kept out the flood so as it proved a very bad tide little better than a neap which put us afterwards to great trouble and hazard the king's majesty came from theobald's though he had been very ill at ease with a scouring taken with surfeiting by eating grapes and landed here about eleven of the clock prince henry attended him and most part of the lords of the council the lord admiral attended by the principal officers of the navy together with myself received him on land out of his barge and conducted him to the place provided for him in mr lydiard's house his dinner was dressed in our great kitchen after dinner came the queen's majesty accompanied with the duke of york lady elizabeth and divers great lords and ladies in her train the drums and trumpets were placed on the poop and foresail and the wind instruments by them so that nothing was wanting to so great a royalty that could be desired when it grew towards high water and all things ready and a great close lighter made fast at the ship's stern and the queen's majesty with her train placed the lord admiral gave me commandment to heave taut the crabs and screws though i had little hope to launch by reason the wind over blew the tide yet the ship started and had launched but that the dock gates pent her in so straight that she stuck fast between them by reason the ship was nothing lifted with the tide as we expected she should and the great lighter by unadvised counsel being cut off the stern the ship settled so hard upon the ground that there was no possibility of launching that tide besides that there was such a multitude of people got into the ship that one could scarcely stir by another the noble prince himself accompanied with the lord admiral and other great lords were upon the poop where the great standing gilt cup was ready filled with wine to name the ship so soon as she had been on float according to ancient custom and ceremony performed at such times by drinking part of the wine giving the ship her name and heaving the standing cup overboard the king's majesty was much grieved to be frustrate of his expectation coming on purpose though very ill at ease to have done me honour but god saw it not so good for me and therefore sent his cross upon me both to humble me and to make me know that howsoever we purposed he would dispose all things as he pleased so that about five of the clock his majesty 
with the queen and all their train departed away to greenwich where then the household were removed prince henry stayed behind a good while after his majesty was gone conferring with the lord admiral principal officers and myself what was to be done and leaving the lord admiral to stay here to see all things performed that was resolved on he took horse and rode after the king to greenwich with promise to return back presently after midnight as soon as the multitudes were gone and things quiet we went presently in hand to make way with the sides of the dock gates and having great store of scavelmen and other labourers we made all things ready before any flood came which performed every man applied himself to get victuals and to take rest the lord admiral sat up all the night in a chair in his chamber till the tide was come about the ship and sir robert mansell sir john trevor and sir henry palmer made shift in my lodgings to rest themselves the beginning of the night was very fair and bright moonshine the moon being a little past full but after midnight the weather was sore overcast and a very sore gust of rain thunder and lightning which made me doubt that there was some indirect working amongst our enemies to dash our launching this gust lasted about half an hour with great extremity the wind being at south-west in the midst of this great gust prince henry and all his train were taken upon the top of blackheath in their coming to woolwich but his invincible spirit daunted with nothing made little account of it but came through and was no sooner alighted in the yard but calling for the lord admiral and myself and sir robert mansell went all presently on board the ship being about two of the clock almost one hour before high water and was no sooner entered but the word being given to set all taut the ship went away without any straining of screws or tackles till she came clear afloat into the midst of the channel to the great joy and comfort of the prince's highness the lord admiral and all the rest of my noble loving friends which mercy of god to me i pray i may never forget his highness then standing upon the poop with a selected company only besides the trumpets with a great deal of expression of princely joy and with the ceremony of drinking in the great standing cup threw all the wine forward towards the half-deck and solemnly calling her by the name of the prince royal the trumpets sounding all the while with many gracious words to me gave the standing cup into mine own hands and would not go from the ship till he saw her fast at her moorings in heaving down to the moorings we found that all the hawsers that were laid on shore for land fasts were treacherously cut to put the ship to hazard of running on shore if god had not blessed us better in the interim of warping to the moorings his highness went down to the platform of the cook-room where the ship's beer stood for the ordinary company and there finding an old can without a lid went and drew it full of beer himself and drank it off to the lord admiral and caused him with the rest of his attendants to do the like about nine the same morning being very rainy he took his barge accompanied with the lord admiral and the rest of his train and giving us a princely gracious farewell rode against the tide to greenwich where he made relation of all the business and the circumstances thereof to the king his father we then came on shore to refresh ourselves with victuals and to take some rest having toiled all the night before and amongst the rest of the company sir henry palmer was pleased to stay dinner where we drank prince henry's health round to hansel the standing cup given at the launching the eighth day of october i began to kill beef at woolwich for the victualling of the resistance for a voyage into the straits the twentieth of october we discharged most part of all the workmen which wrought upon the prince and were paid at deptford the same day the twenty-second day of this month the resistance fell down to the wall and the twenty-seventh day she came down to woolwich and there anchored by the prince this day also i shipped away my household stuff from woolwich to chatham the twenty-ninth day being monday i removed from woolwich to chatham with my wife children and my whole family and the next day i returned again to woolwich divers ships fell down to woolwich and we caused them to anchor by the prince and to help us with all their men to set the prince's masts the first of november being thursday was set the prince's foremast 
and on saturday being the third day her bolt-sprit was set also all the merchantmen's companies helping us the eighth day being thursday the resistance and the rest of the straits ships set sail for gravesend and i went down thither in the resistance and that night went to chatham and the next day returned to gravesend and cleared away my ship the tenth day being saturday betimes in the morning the resistance and the rest of the straits ships set sail from gravesend and went over the next tide i went in the resistance captain john king went in his own ship the matthew and mr jenkins the shipwright went with mr willis in the althea and mr newport went master in the centaur we all anchored in the gore and lay ashore at birchington that night old thomas puniet in our company the next day captain king mr jenkins mr puniet and myself came post to chatham they lay at my house all night and the next day i came up to woolwich with them in my company the prince by this time was wholly rigged and made ready to go to chatham of which having made prince henry's highness acquainted he was pleased to come on board her at woolwich on thursday being the sixth of december where he stayed some three hours being wonderful desirous to have had us set sail if we could possibly have done it without danger sir robert mansell that day attended upon the prince and was by him commanded to go down in her to chatham with us captain king was master thereto being appointed by the prince old john avale was our pilot mr john reynolds the master gunner and lawrence spencer boatswain so soon as it was high water which was about three of the clock his highness went on shore at woolwich where his coach attended at his landing we gave him eleven pieces of ordnance which was all we had then aboard the seventh day of this month sir robert mansell sent his bedding and provision on board the prince and necessaries for the journey and that night he came on board and lay there all night and the next day being saturday the wind being at south-west we made ready to set sail and got our anchors on board but it was a great fog all the morning and at noon it cleared up but it was so little wind that we could scarce bear ahead with all our sails and boats yet we with much ado got as low as half-way tree and there the water being much fallen we anchored all the night the next day being sunday the ninth of december we set sail about one of the clock with a fresh gale at south-west and that night anchored at the lower end of gravesend monday the tenth day we set sail into tilbury hope and for that we wanted a great anchor and cable sir robert thought it fit for us to stay there till we were supplied with all wants for which purpose sir robert went back to london that night and i went home to chatham on friday after being the fourteenth day i returned on board the ship into tilbury hope and presently after sir robert came on board and having received the supply of our wants we made ready to set sail again the next day saturday morning we set sail from tilbury hope and anchored thwart the nore where we lay all that night sunday the sixteenth day we weighed and anchored within sheerness and on monday we got up as high as st mary's creek and the next day being tuesday and the eighteenth day we brought the ship safe to her moorings within the chain of upna for which we gave god thanks so soon as the ship was safe moored sir robert mansell rode away post for london and i went home to my house on the wednesday after i made a journey to london to wait upon the prince my master where i stayed till the saturday after being the twenty-second day and then returned home to chatham and thus ended the year of sixteen ten anno sixteen eleven there passed little worth note till towards the end of april this present year and the twenty-ninth day of this month being on a monday i was by the prince's highness's command sent for to come to london to be at westminster with sir robert mansell that night at supper the message came to me between two and three of the clock in the afternoon i presently caused my horses to be taken up and made ready and presently took horse and according to appointment came thither by seven that night where i found sir robert mansell and oliver cromwell expecting my coming the next morning sir robert mansell and myself repaired to st james's where i received from the prince's own mouth 
his highness's intent to make a private journey to chatham and to go down in his barges round about by queensborough giving me straight charge i should acquaint none with it but make preparation for his lodging and diet and his small train in chatham mr legget's house being appointed the place to receive his own person so being taught my lesson i returned to chatham taking present order for the preparing of all things for his entertainment there was a small merchantman bound for the east country which was purposely sent down into tilbury hope to ride there to refresh his highness on board her and to relieve the watermen to which purpose she was quaintly fitted with all things and a great breakfast prepared for that purpose sir william st john having the charge of seeing it performed being as captain of the ship for present the fifth of may being sunday after dinner i took horse to gravesend where met me captain king who had part of that merchant's ship and was commanded to attend and we lay all night at gravesend on monday morning being the sixth of may the prince's highness took his barges at whitehall by five of the clock he was accompanied with the earls of shrewsbury arundel and earl of mar sir thomas chaloner sir oliver cromwell sir robert mansell and some others of his household servants about nine of the clock his highness came on board where we were ready to receive him after the sea manner with trumpets and drums and after he had refreshed himself the lords broke fast and the watermen relieved with fresh spells we went on against the tide till we came within queensborough water and it was ebbed before we could get as high as upner and so passing along by all the ships his highness was landed at the old dock at chatham a little before six at night and thence walked on foot to mr legget's house where his supper was ready prepared for him for him and his train to his great content the earl of arundel was lodged at a boatswain's house next mr legget's the earl of shrewsbury and earl of mar were lodged at my house the other train in other convenient places tuesday morning betimes according to his highness's directions overnight barges and boats were ready prepared to attend his highness who had broke fast and was ready by seven of the clock and took his barge and went first on board the prince and so from ship to ship of the lower reach taking particular private information from sir robert mansell and myself none else suffered to come near of the state and condition of each several ship in his own table book this done landed and went to dinner where he was very merry and pleasant we having placed fifteen great brass chambers in the garden to be fired when his highness drunk any health and were attended by mr john reynolds master gunner of his own ship who carefully performed his charge dinner done his highness proceeded again in viewing all the ships and pinnaces in the upper reach not leaving out any one which he was not on board of taking the same course with them as was done with the other in the forenoon by which time the day was far spent and his highness returned to his lodging supper being ready against his coming wednesday after his highness had broke fast he took his barges and went up to strood by water all the ships of both reaches giving him a royal farewell with their ordnance which he commanded to be shot even over his barge notwithstanding all the persuasion to the contrary he was landed at strood where his coaches attended him and thence went to gravesend whither i also waited on him and there his highness was received by the magistrates of the town with all their small shot and the ordnance of the blockhouses at his putting in his barge he was pleased to grace me with kissing his hand expressing how well he was pleased with his journey and entertainment thence i returned home to chatham the fourth of june being tuesday being prepared to have gone to london the next day about midnight one of the king's messengers was sent down to me from the lord treasurer to man the light horseman with twenty musketeers and to run out as low as the nore head to search all ships barks and other vessels for the lady arabella that had then made escape and was bound over for france which service i performed accordingly and searched queenborough and all other vessels i could meet with all and then went over to lie in essex and searched the town and when we could hear no news of her went to gravesend 
and then took post horse to greenwich where his majesty then lay and delivered the account of my journey to the lord treasurer by his majesty's command and so was dismissed and went that night to ratcliffe where i lay at captain king's the tenth of june being at london i had news of the arrival of the resistance from the straits whereupon i went presently for chatham and the next morning returned to gravesend and shipped myself in a ketch and was before night set on board the resistance in gore end road where were other ships that came thither in company and amongst the rest one of the east india ships newly come of whom one david middleton was captain i stayed in the gore till the seventeenth day at which time we were purposed to have weighed and come over but there rose such a storm at west and so over blew that divers ships venturing were cast away and they that scraped best lost their masts and ground tackle but god blessed us that we did not lose the ship at all i then having earnest business to be at chatham was set on shore again at margate from whence i took the post horse and came safely that night to chatham giving god thanks for his merciful deliverance about this time sir john trevor having sold his place of surveyor of the navy to one captain richard bingley was come down to chatham to surrender his place unto him at the pay then made and thereupon there was by the new surveyor's means a strict survey made of the whole navy wherein i denied to join before i knew the prince's pleasure but was afterwards persuaded to yield unto it by sir john trevor's importunity whereby i incurred great blame and a sharp check from the prince's highness which i had much ado to pacify by the help of the best friends i had about him being sent for on purpose to richmond to give his highness satisfaction therein about the eighth day of july i paid the company of the resistance for their voyage and presently graved her for another and at the same time i was sent for by the lord admiral of england to hampton court to give an account about the proceedings of the survey made a little before at chatham of the state of the navy and then i was also sent for to attend the prince at richmond to give his highness satisfaction concerning the proceedings therein which he took as an affront because i had not made his grace acquainted with it being hindered by sir richard bingley the seventeenth day of this month being saturday having fitted the resistance in all points for her voyage into the straits she set sail to blackwall and the next morning came to gravesend where i left her and went to chatham and next day being monday morning i brought my wife to gravesend with me where we lay that night and having cleared the ship from thence saw her set sail on tuesday morning betimes and then returned home to chatham at the end of this month i caused the little disdain prince henry's pinnace to be rigged and fitted for me to take the air of the sea to the river's mouth the third of september being tuesday i set sail with a disdain betimes in the morning from upner having the ship manned with divers of my friends in the navy which voluntary went with me as david duck nicholas surtis robert sharp cousin peter pett and others whom i royally victualled and put out of queenborough and with the next flood the wind westerly returned up as high as whole haven where we anchored all night next morning i turned up to gravesend where we anchored in expectance of the company of my friend captain john king who was to come from london to meet me there upon his faithful promise but he failing i with my company dined on shore at gravesend and in the afternoon set sail into tilbury hope where we anchored all night the next morning being thursday the fifth day we weighed betimes in the morning with a fair gale of wind at west and went down as low as the boy of the o's edge where we anchored till the flood before which time the wind hearted in and blew a very fresh gale and before a quarter flood it blew so much wind as we could not maintain our topsails abroad and the sea was so high grown that our little ship would not work so that we had much ado to get up as high as thwart of minster church upon the island of sheppey where close under the edge of the cant we came to an anchor in shoal water by which time it blew up a very great storm the wind at west south west and there we were forced to ride it out till the next day at half flood not without some danger 
and then the wind beginning to duller we weighed and got up under sheerness where we anchored all night and the next day being saturday the seventh day we brought our ship safe to gillingham giving god thanks for our safety and deliverance about the middle of december the honour and defiance being appointed to be brought into dry dock at woolwich the honour to be repaired by mr baker who first built her and the defiance commended to me we began to prepare the dock for the receiving of them in after christmas and so ended this year of sixteen eleven the sixth day of january i went from chatham to woolwich to dock the honour and the defiance on the ninth day we opened the gates and brought in the defiance the next day proved so much wind as we could not stir the honour from her moorings so that she was not docked till the night tide the eleventh day the gates were shut in and corked about the middle of this month prince henry lying at greenwich all the king's master shipwrights were commanded by his highness to attend him about a resolution of building ships in ireland and a proposition was made by mr william borrell to undertake to build one of six hundred tons in the room of the old bonaventure at a rate to build her in ireland myself being appointed to have gone over thither to see him to perform his bargain and every master shipwright brought in plats to the end his highness might make the better choice of what proportions and kinds of moulds he did best approve of for fitness of service about this time also i did accompany captain thomas button to make choice of a ship for the north-west passage in which journey he was to be employed by the appointment of the prince towards the end of this month i attended at deptford to the docking of the dreadnought about the sixth of march the resistance returned home of her voyage and the twenty-third of the same i paid all her company the fourteenth day of april being easter tuesday i came to gravesend to meet captain button who was then going away upon his voyage and we parted together on board his ship from whence i returned to chatham about the middle of june by the commandment of prince henry i began to make ready a frame for a small new ship who was to be as a pinnace to the great ship the prince in which the prince's highness did purpose to solace himself sometime into the narrow seas and therefore she was appointed to be fitted with a very roomy cabin and all other accommodations for that purpose the keel of which ship was laid in the launching place at the old dock at chatham the last day of june being in length seventy two foot in breadth twenty four foot and to draw eleven foot of water of the burden two hundred and fifty tons and tonnage or thereabouts much about the tenth of july i sold the good ship called the resistance to one mr henry mannering brother to sir arthur mannering for seven hundred and odd pounds whereof i received four hundred and fifty pounds down and gave time for the payment of the rest having sir arthur mannering bound for the payment of the same which was not performed in more than two years after the cause that i sold this lucky ship was for that mr william gibbons that was my master in her was by my consent licensed to go with captain button being his near kinsman to the north-west passage the first of august being saturday the prince's highness being to take his progress from richmond i rode from chatham to richmond accompanied with captain john king and mr john reynolds then master gunner of the prince the next day being sunday i waited on his highness to chapel and at dinner he had this day a great deal of private conference with me concerning affairs of consequence after his highness was risen from dinner and had talked with me a while at the bay window of his presence he was pleased to license me to depart to dinner which was prepared for me and my company by mr alexander the principal gentleman usher at mr wilson's house then his highness's tailor from whence i was three times sent for by his highness in dinner-time to attend him to give him satisfaction about sundry material questions wherein he desired to be satisfied which done he sent me to dinner commanding me after i had dined to wait upon him again between two and three of the clock i attended according to his highness's commandment at what time he was pleased to deliver his pleasure to the full unto me with protestation of the trust he reposed in me and the good opinion of my performance of what he was pleased to commend to my charge 
with many princely passages of his gracious favour and intendiments to provide for me in conclusion upon my parting with a most princely loving gravity he gave me a farewell in these words go on cheerfully saith he in that which i entrust you with and let not the care for your posterity encumber you any ways for you shall leave the care both of yourself and them to me who have a purpose carefully to provide for you which gracious speeches took such impression with me that when i came to kiss his highness's hand at parting i could not choose but shed some tears though i little thought as god knoweth that had been the last time i should have seen him alive and those the last words that ever he spake unto me this night we took our leaves at richmond and came to greenwich and lodged that night with mr reynolds at the time of our being at richmond it was concluded by mr alexander and some others of the prince's servants not without his highness's knowledge to come to chatham with their wives to be merry and it was agreed also that we would fetch them to chatham by water in our pinnaces to go round by water which accordingly was by us performed and upon the twelfth day of this month we embarked them at greenwich about five of the clock in the morning to the number of some twenty persons men and women being provided of all manner of victuals and store of wine for our passage and by six at night we arrived at chatham where they were that night entertained at supper and lodged with me as many as we could receive the rest were billeted with mr leggett and other neighbours they were entertained by none but the prince's servants the first day i feasted all the company the second day they were feasted with great royalty on board the great ship the prince dinner and supper accompanied with the principal officers of his majesty's navy where the kings queens and all their children's healths were drunk round with loud report of the ordnance a noise of music attending us all the day we took leave on board about ten of the clock at night our music playing before us and for our farewells there were twenty-five pieces of great ordnance discharged after the watch was set on the saturday being the fifteenth day all the company were feasted dinner and supper at mr john leggett's on the sunday we were all invited to rochester by dr milbourne one of his highness's chaplains and then dean of rochester who bestowed upon us a sermon himself preaching with him we dined and supped and then returned to chatham monday proved so foul and rainy that the company could not take their journey towards london as was purpose they all dined with me and supped at captain king's the next day proved very fair so that after breakfast some in coaches and some on horseback rode for gravesend accompanied with mr leggett captain king and myself where we saw them shipped in a barge and then took our leaves bidding them farewell with some ordnance from both blockhouses the twenty fifth day of september the new charter for incorporating the shipwrights of england granted by king james in which by the same charter i was ordained the first master i was sworn in my place of master the dinner being kept at the king's head in fish street mr dr pay making the sermon at the next church adjoining about this time my picture was begun to be drawn by a dutchman working then with mr rock at rochester the fifteenth day of october my eldest and first daughter anne was born at my house at chatham between one and two of the clock in the afternoon and at that time i had a little fit of sickness which made me keep house nine or ten days the twenty-fifth day of this month the noble prince my master the hope of christendom sickened the twenty-sixth of this month my daughter was baptized in the forenoon at chatham church where mr dr milbourne then dean of rochester preached where a great company of my friends dined with me and were very merry little thinking of the calamity that so soon followed us all in general but to myself in particular by the death of that ever-renowned branch prince henry my royal and most indulgent master at which time began my ensuing misfortune and the utter downfall of all my former hopes to the ruin of all my poor posterity being now exposed to the malicious practices of my old enemies having nothing but the mercies of my good god to trust unto and to comfort me withal end of section seven